And uh, we find here at Ananda that it's better, really the community functions better with almost no rules. Because if we act from understanding rather than from rule, then if some new situation comes up, because of that understanding, we'll know how to handle it. Whereas if it's a rule and a new situation comes up and you run to the rule book and find there isn't a rule to cover it, you're helpless. Whereas if you've understood the principle behind it, then you can apply it in fresh ways again and again. Thus, my feeling is that unless the mistake is drastic, it's far better to let people make the mistake that will help them to understand the underlying principle, because then with that understanding, they'll always be able to carry on. This is the way Sri Yukteswar taught uh, Master the, the uh, Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. <laughs> He had him just try to get to the, to the heart of every aphorism. And Master, being a young man, wanted to get ahead. And Sri Yukteswar said, you haven't completely understood this aphorism yet. One little aphorism. It took them eight months to go just uh, partway through the first chapter in the Yoga Sutras. But after those eight months, Sri Yukteswar closed the book. He said, now you've understood. Any scripture that you pick up, you'll understand. You don't need to read anymore. Well, that's real teaching, isn't it? Getting so to the core of understanding that you can apply it in any direction. And I found that Master's teaching does that, that many times I can pick up uh, a scripture and understand it even though I've never read it before. Even, understand it even though it's in a totally new context. But relating it to what you understand, relating it to these inner realities that are like the the hub of a wheel with spokes going in all directions. Once you're at the hub, you can see everything in proportion. You can see the, the spokes in a logical pattern, whereas if you were on the uh, perimeter of the wheel, you would see these spokes going in all sorts of different directions, and they wouldn't seem to have the same uh, uh, cohesive pattern. So this is the real, as I said, challenge of our century the challenge of bringing in a new flow. With that new flow, I said there were two things. This is still only two aspects of one thing, the disintegration of the old form-bound consciousness and the introduction of the more flowing, more intuitive kind of consciousness. The other one is that we are at a time of a greater awakening of the spirit not just sort of an intuitive flow in our work and in our dealings and so on, but a greater awareness of who we really are. Becoming aware of ourselves, too, more in terms of energy. Becoming aware, for example, that the, it's energy that we send to the body to move the hand, that it's energy moving around in the brain that creates thinking and uh, uh, awakens memories and so on. All of these things can be understood in these energy terms. We begin to see ourselves as not so much the body as something else. And that something else applies more closely to uh, the idea of God. We're living in a century where God seems to be, um, many people say, dead. At least obviously forgotten by most people. We're living in an age that's far less spiritual in some ways, or at least far less religious than past ages. And yet, it's a very spiritual age. I remember one time many years ago when I told my mother I wasn't going to go to church with her anymore. And she was so upset she wept. She was afraid I'd go to hell. Then she read something in a book and she quoted this to me. She said that she'd read that uh, uh, many times atheism is the first step toward a deeper faith. And I was glad she'd understood because that's where we're at in this century. It isn't that people are getting away really from those old values, it's that they, they've understood that they're inadequate, but there is a longing for something else. God is very strong in this century, and there is a seeking for God in this century among people like us here, among people all over the world who have the desire to commune with him rather than merely go to church, that is very much stronger than it was a hundred years ago. Then people were happy to go to church and sing, give me that old time religion and so on. <laughs> If it was good enough for Father, it's good enough for me. Um, there wasn't any wish to get something more. There, you got religion by just uh, 
deciding that you really wanted to be a part of that church and sing its hymns. Um, now people aren't satisfied with that, but there is a growing desire. I read in Newsweek a few years ago that something like, what was it, five million Americans are meditating in one way or another. That's a wonderful thing. Master said that if he had come to this country 50 years earlier, people wouldn't have been ready for his message. It isn't only the insecurity that makes people think more deeply, that's certainly part of it, but it's also that which created the insecurity that makes them think more deeply. That which created the insecurity is the fact that they're thinking more deeply, the fact that they're not satisfied with old molds and they're seeking new ones. Even those people who are seeking new uh, molds that are rigid, like communism and all the rigid rules and so on that go around, that revolve around that ideology, it's still a mark of this spirit of man trying to find some new answers. And sometimes we get into a cul-de-sac and it doesn't work. But the direction that the century is going through and when all the dust is settled is toward a greater spirituality. We are at a time now when God communion is coming to the fore. As Master said, we must know God and the time for knowing him has come. That's why he was sent to the West. That's why um, the teaching of yoga has been brought out of the Himalayas and down into the marketplace, so to speak. That's why we find so many people coming uh, to the West teaching yoga. That's why we find so many groups in churches re realizing suddenly that, oh, meditation is a part of our tradition. We don't have to learn it from foreigners. We can practice our own. All of this is healthy and wonderful. And by the next century, we're going to see a very great change in this regard. But meanwhile, here we are in a, in a century of chaos. And it's a very important thing for us individually, and it's a very important thing for us as a race also to understand how we can go with that. Because what happens is that these rays of energy come into the world and it's even conceivable, though it's less likely, that mankind would let that energy go or take it in a wrong direction. Remember what I said about uh, energy can, genius can be evil as well as good. We can take that heightened energy and if we're perverse enough, we can turn that energy toward evil and repression and, and uh, uh, all the things that you and I find most odious. Indeed, we can, we can turn this energy and send this planet in, a, in an evil direction. It's not, it's not as if s spirituality is being sent to us so much as energy, which we have to take in our own way. And some people are taking it and mastering to a very refined degree ways of torturing people, making them insane. A total misuse of that energy. Therefore, we also have a responsibility. It's not just as if well, it's going to happen automatically. It's that we have to try to tune ourselves to that and bring that light out into the world. It's our duty. This is why we were born. This is why we've been attracted here, not only for ourselves, but also to help bring that light out into the world. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. And yet one person, as India, in India they say, one moon gives more light than all the stars. One person who has that kind of calmness within himself can exert an influence over many hundreds of other people. So you don't need to think in terms of uh, a voting booth. You don't need to think, well, only when we're a majority numerically will be, we be able to really change things. Only a small number of people can change if you really have that kind of energy. So here we have two things that are incumbent upon us. One is to try, in the midst of the chaos and difficulties that we are faced with, to discover some kind of peace and strength within ourselves. And the other is not to bo bottle it up in ourselves, but to share it with other people and to help them also to receive some of this light, because it does come through people. That divine light is always manifested through the instrumentality of people. It doesn't come just because God wills a change. He sends a saint. He sends an avatar. As it says in the 
Bhagavad Gita, whenever evil increases and virtue declines, I incarnate myself in this world as an avatar to bring virtue back again and to put down the evil. But it has to be done through that instrumentality. And the avatar can't do it just alone on a, on a mountaintop. He has to reach the hearts of those who are receptive. And through them he can work. It always has to be through people. And if the people aren't receptive, then the work just doesn't grow. You and I, all of us. I mentioned in my Christmas letter that the work of Master is a work not only in organization, but it's also principles that he brought out that we can live by, that we are serving his work when we meditate. We are serving his work when we try to act as instruments for his ray and bring that light and that joy to other people. If when you're with people, you will try to tune into that consciousness inwardly and radiate that consciousness outward. That's serving his work. I don't mean, therefore, in a general way that you, you, you become a better person because you meditate and acting in a better way, people feel better. No, I mean deliberately trying to be an instrument for that ray. I mean thinking, thinking of Master, for example, and asking him to bless somebody through you. Feeling Master's presence in your heart and asking him. There's that story in, in the path, remember? A very uh, wonderful story that this woman told me in San Rafael. She had been talking about Master briefly. No, she had Master's picture in the car. Her husband was very much down on anything. He was jealous of Master. Master had been gone for 25 years, but he was still jealous. And uh, so he was talking against Master. And she was very much a disciple, and she felt very upset by it. And she knew that if she said anything, he, it would just... Uh, but add fuel to his fire of anger. And so she just prayed inwardly, Master, make him be quiet. And suddenly, from one moment to the next, he stopped. And he didn't say another word for the whole drive. And they reached home, and they went indoors. He didn't say anything the rest of the night. Well, again and again, you and I, those of you who are on this path, and that's most of you, have experienced this reality. That that attunement, it isn't something that comes by merely using your power. It's by tuning yourself to that greater power and asking to be allowed to be a channel for that power that you will find that miracles can be accomplished, that amazing things can happen. As we act as instruments for that light, as we act consciously, not just living our philosophy, that's an important thing to do too, but living our attunement. And that's something that many people don't think to do. I was talking to um, Bill Le Cicero the other day, and he, he suggested an idea that it might be good for Earth Song. I said, have you meditated on it? Have you asked Master? And he said, well, no. I, I asked him about little things, but this sort of thing seems too big. But uh, I said, no. Ask, ask everything. You'll find that the answers come when we attune ourselves to him. And it'll help you to clean the slate before you ask him. Don't have preconceived ideas. I found again and again that if I can get that slate clean enough, then the idea is given. We need to do everything that we do, not to feel, oh, well, this is outside the realm of his interest. After all, this is business. God is everywhere. God is as interested in a, in a straw as he is in the theory of relativity. In fact, the contrast between them spells something, offers some insight into the theory of relativity. The whole idea of bringing that, serving that ray and bringing that ray outward into the world is much of the drama that's going on. You and I are actually warriors in the true war that's going on in this century. Sure, there will be probably another world war. Sure, millions of people will be killed. Sure, there will be great suffering. No fun. We know that. But even so, that's not the real war. The real war is between light and darkness. And the darkness is represented by those people who are trying to hang on to form, brittleness, logic, just a, a rationalism and legalism and, and uh, the limitations that those things imply 
on the one hand, and those people who are trying to bring light and bring a free flow of love and joy. That's why I say that the women's energy today is a much more important thing than probably almost any woman living knows. If you could understand it and not take it in an egotistical way, but rather just as in, be instruments for the Divine Mother. Men can be that too, because after all, it's really only love we're talking about. But it's that loving energy that we need. Then the next thing is how to develop that power within ourselves so that we aren't affected by the turmoil when it comes. How to have that kind of power that can free us. Master said that those who follow this path will be protected in the turmoil and chaos and difficult times to come. What did he mean by that? It would be very easy to take it in a sectarian way, to say, oh, well, God favors uh, followers of this particular path, and if you have signed on the dotted line that you're a member, then God will see to it that you're okay. Well, that isn't what he meant. It it can't be what he meant. I I can't um, declare it confidently or categorically, but it just can't be. It makes no sense that way. God doesn't play favorites. What it does mean is that those people who are practicing the principles of this path, those who are in tune with this path, certainly, because that attunement is what gives you gives it to you more than anything else, but meditation, upliftment of consciousness into God, those people who have that have a certain aura of protection. Now, this is something that's very important to understand because that's the same kind of aura of protection, of power, that we also want to bring out to others. We're really dealing with an energy body here, not just with the physical body. There's a limit to how much the physical body can do in the way of saying things, for example. But if you say those things with energy, then suddenly you find that they they have the power to change. You can say, make a statement with truth behind it, energy behind it, and that statement has to be materialized as reality just because you said it. Some people can speak and speak and speak and nobody listens. Other people say one word and everybody feels something. It depends on the energy behind it, on the consciousness. And so, both these realities, both the idea of serving the ray to help other people and help to bring this change in a beneficial way to the human race, and this idea of self-protection in times of difficult, uh, in the difficult times ahead, both of these relate to the same truth. We can explain that truth in very simple uh, ways, ways related to scientific principles that we know. That when you introduce electricity into a wire, it creates a magnetic field. When that energy flow is strong, when the electricity flow is strong, the magnetic field is strong also. When it's weak, the magnetic field is weak. We are, ma- we are uh, all the nerves in our system. Max Planck did some, some experiments with nerve tissue and with uh, electrical wire. And he found that there was no difference in their response. That in essence, the nerves are electrical wires transmitting energy from the brain to the body and from the body back to the brain. These nerves, with the energy that flows through them, create an aura. That's what the magnetic field of the body is. It's your aura. And when that energy is strong, the aura is strong. And when the energy is weak, the aura becomes weak. When you're discouraged, you're a prey for all sorts of things. And when you feel courage, energy, somehow you're immune. When you feel, for example, uh, full of energy, you may not succumb to illness that other people are coming down with. When you, I, I've noticed this, that when I had work to do, if I felt illness coming on me, I would just put out enough energy and the illness would go. Then when I felt that it would be convenient to be ill because it would give me an excuse to rest, then suddenly I was ill. But the energy that you put out, if you haven't the time to be ill, you won't be ill. Illness comes usually as sort of a luxury. But 
that energy field and that, that magnetic field, that aura, has a great deal more to it than that. There are two aspects to it. One is that it, being magnetic, attracts to itself its own. I was always amazed when I lived that year in Charleston, South Carolina. It was a small town, and so it was easier to get to know many people. And I was at a point in my life where I wanted to meet many people anyway because I wanted to understand what made people tick, so to speak. And uh, I met people on all levels of society. In a town that size, it was easier to do. The thing that astonished me was that whereas it took me uh, a lot of effort and time to find people on different levels and try to see how they worked on these different levels, people who came into town knew who belonged on those levels, within a day or two, had already found those levels. How they found it, I don't know. But for each one, it was as if that was the world. And they attracted people who were in that world. And if they were criminal or uh, low types, they would immediately go there. If they were people of more... Uh, high values, they would immediately, and it was as if the lower types didn't exist. It was fascinating to see. The kind of energy that you put out is that which attracts to you everything that you get. That's how karmic law works. Karma uh, is a kind of sealed energy that blossoms forth and manifests itself, and through that sends out a kind of magnetism that draws to you the things that you uh, experience. That's why Master said, for example, that if a person had an accident while driving, that he shouldn't drive for six months. Because what it meant was that that was a karmic thing that attracted that accident, and that karmic thing might not be worked out yet, and it would continue to attract accidents. And I've seen here in the community that people, when something goes wrong, things keep going wrong for a while. It's necessary to understand that that is a magnetism that's being sent out, in this case a negative magnetism. Or you know how people have winning streaks in gambling, let's say. They, they're even confident. They can feel that energy. They can feel that they're going to win. And they do. People on the battlefield many, many times would write home confident letters until finally one day they would say, I feel that today a bullet has my name on it, and that would be the day they'd be killed. But they would feel, you're conscious of the kind of energy flowing through you. Really, it's determined by karma, but it can also be changed. That karmic can, karma can be changed by your own will. You can generate, for example, enough of a positive kind of energy to negate the negative. You can, you can create a new kind of magnetism that also creates a protective sort of envelope around you so that anything, it's like an umbrella in the rain. The rain you can't stop, but it won't hit you, or it'll only just get a little bit on you if you have an umbrella. It'll be falling all around you. So if you can understand that whatever you attract to yourself is indeed a uh, result partly of your magnetism that you're sending out to attract that, and partly because of the strength or, or uh, quality of the protective shield of your own magnetic aura, these are what determine what comes to you. I was told a story by a woman in India who had a guru, and she said that she was with the guru in the jungle with a group of disciples one time when they had a very heavy tropical storm, rain falling everywhere. She said that right in their enclosure, a circle just big enough to enclose their group, there was no rain. That's, that's quite an astonishing manifestation of this power of energy, that it could affect matter to such an extent that even rain won't hit you. But indeed, we have that kind of power to varying degrees. There's that story of Mr. Black, Yogananda's disciple, visiting Encinitas one time. And Mr. Black tol told me the story. He was in his room when he got a message that Master wanted him to go out driving with him. And he looked out the window and he saw it was just pouring rain, just heavy and he thought, well, it won't be much of a ride. But anyway, I want to be with Master. So he got his jacket and went outside. It took about two minutes to get into the driveway where the car was. And he got to the driveway, he got to the car, and he looked. There was no rain. The ground was dry. The sky was blue. And he looked at Master like this. And Master, with a quiet smile, said, for you, Oliver. Oh. <laughs>
but this kind of power exists in you also, in varying degrees, obviously. Where you couldn't do that, or you might not be able to create a, an aura around you, you might at least be able to create it such that you get home before, it's, before it starts raining. Um, in many ways, you'll find that your life can go differently if you can generate the right kind of energy. And negative energy somehow attracts disaster. Some people are disaster prone. No matter what they do, something goes wrong. I remember this, this disciple, uh, James Collar, I've mentioned him to some of you, uh, of Yogananda's. He had what Yogananda described as commotion karma. <laughs> Everything he did somehow was uh, it created a catastrophe. His first arrival at Encinitas, he, he came late at night, and in the middle of the night he didn't know where the bathroom was, and he was desperate, and so he went out and uh, squatted on the bluff there. And The next morning, a very dignified older disciple, Mr. Brockway, came out and wanted to take a sun bath and lay down right in that. <laughs> that was the beginning of James Collar's... <laughs> One day he saw grass growing too tall and he thought, well, this is much too tall. We ought to get rid of it. So he was sort of like a sylph throwing, dancing through the fields, throwing matches. Pretty soon there was this prairie fire sweeping up toward Mount Washington. They barely managed to contain it. <clears throat> At the Lake Shrine one day, Master, somebody had given him a, a BB gun, I think it was, and there were some ducks that were eating the fish, and Master shot the, duck, the gun over the ducks, trying to hope, hoping to scare the ducks away. And James saw, was with Master, and he said, <laughs> like this. So the next day, James saw the gun there, and he thought, I wonder how this thing works, like this bang. One, one bullet, not aimed at all, killed a duck. <laughs> some woman who happened to see it reported him to the police. <laughs> <laughs> created this big commotion. That's when Master said he has commotion karma. <laughs> Some people just attract these things. It depends not just on a blind karma over which you have no control. It also depends upon the kind of thought, the vibration that you're putting out. And if you find that you're attracting um, commotion, disaster, accidents, or whatever it is that you're attracting, then change yourself. Don't think that, well, if I can just get the world to treat me differently, it will be, uh, life will be so much easier. The world will treat you according to what you're putting out. And you might say then, well, look at Jesus. Did, was he putting out the, the uh, thought of being crucified? In a way, perhaps he was. He certainly uh, aggravated them enough, calling them, um, what was he calling them? Many bad things. <laughs> You are children of the devil and things. Uh, but at the same time, he wasn't putting out that kind of vibration. He was putting out a vibration of love. He was trying to shake them into understanding. And so we can't really legitimately say that he drew it upon himself. It was the normal response that we find of darkness to light. But he wasn't touched by it. Even when he was crucified, he wasn't touched. And so you will find that there are times when things will come, but you won't be touched by it you'll inwardly know that this is just a part of the... It'll be like that storm falling all around you, but here you are, secure. I'm reminded of that, that wonderful story of a saint in India, Haridas, who was a Muslim by birth, but converted to Hinduism and became a devotee of Krishna. And the Muslim judge condemned him to be beaten to death because he wouldn't recant his beliefs. And so he was strung up by his thumbs from a tree, and these men were, with cudgels, beating him to kill him. And Haridas, even then, wasn't touched. Even then, he wasn't only praying uh, for their forgiveness. He even went a step further. He said, may they be blessed with the joy that I feel. And the crowd watching him, just the usual crowd that gathers at such things, <laughs> Presumably some of them were, were uh, good people there out of deep compassion for him, but presumably also there were others who were there just out of a sort of a 
prurient interest and curiosity, they began to feel this joy, and they started dancing and singing God's name, feeling just ecstasy. And these men with their cudgels, whose duty it was to kill him, dropped their cudgels and began dancing too. So changed were they by that. So you see, even if you attract what looks to the outward eye as disaster, Master said many of the martyrs, those who died with real faith, they, weren't, they didn't feel pain. We see what was being done to them. It looks like pain, but they felt joy inwardly. So it remains true, regardless of what it looks like outwardly, that you have this protection in yourself. According to mass karma, you might indeed... Uh, well, let's put it this way. You have your own karma, and according to that karma, you have to die at a certain time. And you're not going to be protected against that. But supposing there is a mass karma. You might indeed not have the karma to die if you're on a plane that crashes. But because the group karma is strong enough, you're drawn into that group karma. We don't individually probably have the karma to go through atom wars and all the terrible things that are going on in this century. It seems very unlikely that we have brought this thing on. We're a part, however, of a mass karma that has brought it on. And to some extent, we're going to be affected by it, whether we like it or not. If there's a widespread de uh, depression and starvation, we're certainly not going to be uh, eating off the fat of the land. There won't be any. But we'll somehow carry on. We'll be protected in that way. Moreover, the mass karma of destruction, if you create a strong enough good karma of protection, you will be protected like people who, who were planning to be on, on let's say, the, the uh, um, Lusitania that, was, that went down and decided at the last moment that they shouldn't go. There was just some feeling they didn't want to go. That was the kind of protection we're talking about. Or even if you were on such a ship, you would be in some way saved. If your karma is strong enough or if the energy that you put out is strong enough you, you can create enough power of your own not to have to be sucked in to the mass karma. Now, this is a part of our... Uh, this is what Yogananda meant when he said that the, the followers of this path would be protected because what you're doing is generating a very strong aura of your own. And you will find that wherever you go, you aren't touched. Because I came into this body with some of that kind of karma. I remember when I roomed with Rod Brown in, in college... Whenever he went out alone, some terrible thing would happen. Um, he, he had a very excitable kind of nature that attracted that kind of thing. But when he and I went together, nothing ever happened. When I went out alone, nothing ever happened. I used to feel sort of discouraged by this because I wanted, <laughs> I, I wanted to be a writer and I thought, well, I must experience life. And here this guy's getting guns pulled on him and people chasing him down a dark alley with knives and getting caught in a barroom brawl and all these things. Nothing ever happened when I was there. The brawl would, have, would happen about two minutes after I left or something. But in fact, you'll see that the world will be a different world for you. Each one of us lives in a different world. Even though we seem to be in the same world, somehow we draw to us and move within a milieu that's our own, of our own making. And uh, if you have the wrong kind of consciousness, you can be put in a paradise kind of setting, and within two years you'll ruin it. That's what happened, has happened in slum areas where they've tried to uh, knock down the old buildings and create new ones. Within two years it becomes another slum. That's the kind of consciousness they generate. It's the kind of environment, therefore, that they create. So we can, in fact... By the practice of Kriya Yoga, by being in tune with this ray of divine power that has been brought into our lives, we can generate enough power to protect ourselves and to protect those who are within the aura of our influence. An astonishing thing here at Ananda has been the fact that with all the years that we've been here, we've had virtually no serious accidents. The... the uh, statistical po probabilities are uh, so high against that as to be astronomical. The protection that people have when they're in a spiritual environment or with spiritual people 
or even living on their own in the city, but generating enough of that kind of power. I've seen it happen again and again, even before I came on the path. I, I discovered that according to the kind of expectation I put out, I attracted those kinds of results. When I got discouraged and uh, weakened in my energy because of the discouragement, then nothing went right. When I got back my former optimism, suddenly everything was going right again. The stronger your thought that way, it can't be just a sort of passive uh, goodwill. It's got to be done with a great deal of energy. But when you do, there's a certain way that it seems to work best. If you think of it as your energy, it's very limited. It doesn't work nearly as well. If you think, I will let this happen, you can do some. But that thought of ego also blocks the flow. And you see, this is where you send it from, through the point between the eyebrows. The ego is centered in the medulla oblongata. If there's the thought of I involved, then the ego creates a block to that energy which should flow through the ego to the spiritual eye. It should be a free flow up the spine, all your energy pouring outward, and that can't be done when there's the thought of I'm doing it. That's why it's so important to feel that God is the doer in your life. If you, instead of offering this, this uh, determination into your ego, I am the doer, offer the ego into the flow of inspiration, then suddenly you find that uh, you're releasing a lot of power. Now, the thing that works even better is to feel that you're doing it with God, with Divine Mother, with Master. That, not for God, for God is good. It's a lot better than doing it for yourself, but with is still better. I had a very interesting experience recently in, in uh, Sorrento, as I told some of you a few weeks ago. I went there because I was afraid that working as hard as I had been here, the energy was such that, that I wouldn't be able to go into seclusion. I needed seclusion, but I was afraid that what I'd do is just keep being tempted to work again. After all, my work is right there in my house. And if I went elsewhere, then I, I uh, wasn't sure the environment would be conducive. Anyway, people in Italy invited me there, and so I went there. And I had this house that they told me. Well, they warned me that there would be some, some noise outside, rumore, as they put it. And rumore sounds so much like rumor that you, don't, you think of it as something small. I envisioned some sort of uh, uh, gardener outside with a hoe working on a flower bed and sort of humming O Sole Mio under his breath. <laughs> I figured, well, I could put up with this. <laughs> and it turned out that they were doing heavy work, building a big retaining wall with a huge cement mixer, and six men shouting at each other over the noise of that cement mixer, pounding on the walls of the building right outside my room. It sounded as if they were pounding on the walls of my room. And this was Saturday morning. They broke it. They, they stopped work at 12. But I, I said to the people there, I didn't come for this. I'm sorry. But I, I need seclusion more than I need anything else. And uh, I, I feel that this is a very important time for me spiritually. So much as I, I, would not want, I don't want to offend you, I, I am not going to put up with this. I'm going back home. It seems ridiculous to come all this way, but that's the way I feel. And that's what I'm going to do. And they were feeling very badly about that. And so I said, well, there's one thing that could keep me here, and that's if it rains. So I said, let's just ask Divine Mother for rain. And as I said that, I put out a very strong thought, Divine Mother, come along, we, we've got to do this right here. It's, it's not nice to come all this way. And, and uh, <laughs> So I, I didn't do a big thing, uh, and I didn't think of me. I just, I just sort of gave it to Divine Mother. It's your problem, but... Do the right thing by us, will you? <laughs> it rained solidly the whole time, and so they weren't able to work. Well, again and again, I found that when I bring God into the picture and do it with God, it works in a very different way from if I will. I can put out the will to do a thing, and uh, it doesn't seem to work nearly so clearly, nearly so, so smoothly and well. So both of these things are, are essential if we're really to do it right. The first is to generate the energy ourselves. God doesn't do it for you. You have to be the instrument. You, you, you have to do the willing. 
But you have to will it in the right way. Your own but God-given power is the balance between the old way of passive faith and the sort of new theological school of uh, positive thinking that thinks you're doing it all. Somewhere between the two, you have to take his power, generate it by your will, and then in cooperation with it, let the flow go on. It's something that can't really be put clearly into words. I can suggest it, but only by experience can you learn how it works the best. The first thing is, during your practice of, of meditation, during your life, learn to be positive. Learn to say things, do things in a positive way. Um, it isn't negative to see faults. It's negative to be pulled down by what you see. We, we see things that need correcting, and if we didn't see them, then the world would remain uh, in darkness. When, when you're trying to do a good thing, you've got to see where it can be improved, and that means to be aware of where it isn't right. But to be negative means to feel badly and helpless and dark about it all. If Master had said something against somebody, as sometimes he did say, he said it in such a way that, that uh, didn't make you hate that person. Somehow you felt sorry for him, or you felt sorry for the situation and so on, but it didn't, it didn't lower your consciousness. He would always say it in such a way and with that kind of energy that would give you the, the will to try to make things better. For some people, when they talk to you about something negative, you go away feeling unclean, dirty, dark, helpless, lacking in hope. And this is a sign of negativity. Negativity is that which offers you no solution, no way out, merely paralyzes your will. This you don't want. We want to generate that kind of energy then that is positive, and that means trying to think in positive ways. Here in, in the community, we, in the early years, had many people who were there trying to say, oh, this won't work, that won't work, and so on. And I would always say, well, if you can give me a good alternative, then I'll listen. But if you're only going to say why it isn't good, then I'm not going to listen, because that will paralyze my will and our will, and we won't get anywhere. It's easy to say why a thing isn't good, I could point out faults in, in uh, the way Yogananda did things just because when you do anything, you're not doing something else. And that, to a negative mind, could be considered a fault. In fact, it wasn't a fault. It was his deliberate decision to do it in that way. Reminds me of this, this uh, um, talk show host, Joe Pine. I don't know if any of you saw Joe Pine. Very negative, always trying to point out the evil in things. And I was at my parents' home and turned on the TV one time and flicked uh, the knob and there suddenly was Joe Pine. I was about to flick it off when I saw that he was talking with a friend of mine who was a, a teacher from India. And Joe Pine, I, I left it on, and Joe Pine listed all the statistics of the people starving and the people poor and the people ill and the vast numbers of people needing help in India. And he said, now I ask you, sir, with all the help that they, those people in your own country need, what are you doing in this country? And uh, <laughs> the man said, it took me many years to decide what I was going to do with my life, and I have made that decision, and I feel that it's none of your business. <laughs> So, Yogananda had made the decision to do what he did. And somebody who thought that he ought to do something else could come along in a very negative way. Yeah, but he didn't do so and so. <laughs> and uh, a positive person will always try to find ways of supporting, ways of helping, ways of doing things better. You need to have that positive energy, not because it makes other people feel better, but because it's the only thing that's going to help you to get your trip together. All positive thoughts draw, create positive magnetism and draw positive things to you. The kind of energy you put out, you can talk about how dark everybody else is, but what are you attracting to yourself? More and more reason to feel dark, because in fact you will attract the very justification for your attitudes, just because that's the magnetism you're putting out. If you want to see evil, you'll see more and more reason why that evil is there, and you'll end up feeling just totally... Uh, in darkness.
But if you really want to, and you'll see that people who are negative, their things are just always just not right for them. They're always encountering misfortune and difficulties, and friends don't stay loyal to them, and they can't attract good people to their lives and hold them. But uh, it's all a question of that kind of vibration they are putting out. When you put out positive goodwill, positive enthusiasm, um, if you always try to see the good side of things, if you always try to do good for people, if you always try to have a giving kind of energy, what you will do is create that kind of willingness that, as Master said, the greater the will, the greater the flow of energy. With that willingness, you're going to be generating a kind of energy, because it's not blocked by an opposing energy, that will be many, many times stronger. And as a result of that powerful flow, the magnetic aura that you will, that you will generate will be so powerful that only good things will be able to come to you. We can do that for ourselves. We can also do it for those who are dear to us. We can also do it if we are living with people who are trying to do the same thing. What I've noticed is that as this community has become more and more uh, clear in its own self-definition, more and more it attracts people who are like that and others get repelled. They can't stay because it's not their thing. Those people who are really trying to do a positive thing of goodwill and love draw more and more, however, people who have that kind of goodwill and love. From far and near, they begin to feel that magnetism, where in the beginning it was just people who were close by. More and more, it's people from all around the world who come. They sense something. They don't know what it is, but they know that it's an important part of what they're looking for. This kind of influence is something that you can create, not so much on your own, but in communion with others of like mind. And this, I think, is a very important aspect to this whole subject of building spiritual power against troubled times, that we can't do it just alone. We've got to do it with others. We can't do it um, even, yes, it helps if we're off there meditating by ourselves. If we have enough people meditating even by themselves, it does change the vibrations of the planet to some small degree. But when you get a vortex of energy created by a group of people either living together or in attunement with each other, which is the real meaning of living together, not just your bodies together, but you can be at distances from each other and still have this attunement going, that kind of vortex of shared faith and shared um, practice can generate a kind of light in this planet, like a lighthouse shining into darkness that can indeed change the course of destiny. This is something that the eyes don't see. This is something that the reason can't quite grasp. And yet it's a statement that's been made by many great teachers. It's not just something that I'm suddenly inventing because it sounds poetic or something. It's a truth. In the Bible it said that if uh, God told Abraham that if ten righteous men could be discovered in, uh, was it Sodom or Gomorrah, that they, those cities wouldn't be destroyed. Ten people who are in tune with that <coughs> ray of divine light and manifesting that outward can so change the quality of the darkness that the whole destiny of the people will change. A few people in this country, this is a, a, an experiment that, that um, for the sake of you, those of you who haven't been here before, I'll tell the um, transcendental meditation people have this idea that if uh, I think it's 1% or 2% of a people will be meditating, that it will make a significant difference. Anyway, they moved into Rhode Island in large numbers because it's such a small state and gave many classes and got many people meditating. And an independent news service a year later quoted the statistics that within that year, suicide rates had dropped about 51%. Murders had dropped off about 53%. Accidents on the highway, about 47%. Again and again, things were different. Um, even the weather was better. It does. The consciousness that we put out affects even the climate. It affects everything. And if we can change that consciousness, 
even a few people, because you see that negative energy doesn't really have any cohesive power. Negative people can't really hold together very well. And so, even if the numbers of people who are being negative or merely neutral are much greater, that power from a few people sending out positive energy can really affect the whole in a very positive way. We have that duty. We have that duty to ourselves. We have that duty to our loved ones. We have that duty to the human race. Because if this change is really to take place in the, in the best way possible, it'll take place anyway. But it can be all the way from the best way to the worst way, and the most likely scenario would be somewhere in between. But if it's to be in the best way possible, that depends on you. It isn't just something that will happen automatically. If you choose to be a, an instrument for that ray of divine power, inwardly feeling, Master, how can we help this person? How can we help that situation? You'll be surprised how if you bring him into your decisions, if you bring him into what you're doing, how greatly it will affect your world and in the process, of course, be a part of affecting the whole world around us. What do we see for the future? We're in a very insecure age right now. But as time goes on, what do we see? It seems to me that there's hardly any way that we can avoid a blow-up on this planet. I don't see that it's possible. Not that it isn't desirable. It's just that the negative karma of this planet is so great that it seems to me that some kind of catastrophe is uh, unavoidable. Nuclear war, I'm sure, will be a part of it. Master said that there won't be a corner of this planet that will be safe. But this is only a sort of a purification process. And although the years ahead of us, I think, are, are leading us toward greater and greater insecurity and terror, beyond that, he said there would come a time after this century when people would be so fed up with war that for another 300 years, I believe he said, there would be peace. People just wouldn't want war anymore. They'd, they'd know from the memory of our civilization what a terrible thing it, it, it was. Somebody told me in India that a great saint had predicted that within the next 25 years or so, this civilization as we know it would be destroyed. That doesn't mean civilization would be destroyed. It means that the outward forms of it would be destroyed, but that a new thing would supplant it based on the knowledge that we've created, but more in tune with the truths that are, uh, the more spiritual truths that are inherent in those discoveries, that would bring society to a period of peace and prosperity such as we haven't known in recorded history. It will be indeed a golden age comparatively to what we've known. Communities like this will be a very important part of that picture where small groups of people will live together, sharing their ideals together, relating to each other in a human way rather than this great uh, problem of alienation that people feel today in our cities, where they don't even know their next-door neighbors. We think of the future usually in terms of scientific gadgetry, but in fact what's happening is only superficially that, the technological advances. The real changes are coming about in the human understanding of individuals. They come from individuals. We, we, we are going to be more in tune with the, the superconscious, and that comes from the individual. It can't come on a social or governmental level. People here and there re realizing more and more clearly that what they have to do is find their perfection first inside if they are ever to manifest it outside. That we can't have a system that's going to do it for us. We've got to change ourselves. And if we change ourselves in the right way by attuning ourselves with that higher reality, then everything will flow more beautifully. This is the future of our planet, not to be talked about in terms of space travel and so on, all of which will come, but will be less and less meaningful to people as people discover more and more again human values. This again is why feminine energy is needed. Women are better with people. Men are better with things. That people energy, that sharing on a, on a human level will become a much more important part of life. It seems almost as if the difference between 
the female mind and the male mind is that the male mind is the creator and the female mind is the enjoyer. And that ability to enjoy is something that we've lost sight of in our wish to just keep running around doing more and more things. We need the ability to sit back and enjoy it again. The balance between these two is that which introduces again into human life this intuitive flow that I've been talking about. Over the next few years, I think that we're going to be having, it looks as if it's coming more and more strongly. When I wrote the book, The Road Ahead, I said certain things that haven't yet come fully to pass, although they are obviously becoming more and more predominant in human affairs. It seems inescapable that we're going to have a uh, great financial crisis. Many, many people are writing that way now. Ten years ago, very few were, and they were being laughed at. Now it's pretty common idea, <clears throat> pretty common uh, belief in, in among many econ economic writers. They call it doomsaying, but nevertheless they, they see that the scenario is there. It's very possible. I think it's probably inescapable, given, again, the karma of our planet. But when there's a Great Depression, again, it doesn't mean that everybody's poor. There's still the same amount of money going around. It's just harder to get at, or it's worth less, until finally worthless. <laughs> and we can carry on well if we learn to live simply. We can carry on well if we learn to live closer to God. We don't have to suffer by that. We still have our energy. We still have our strength. And we can use that energy to serve. You don't have to be afraid of these times. Just learn to adjust. I was amazed how in Arizona a few years ago, I was able to live on $10 a month. Now maybe I'd, it would be 20 or 30 but even so, then everybody would have said it was totally impossible, and I found it was possible by living simply, by cooking simple things. Uh, many things that are simple are still high in food value. In other words, if we, if we learn to live more according to our own inner strength and less by trying to create our strength in the things that we gather around us, then again, I think that we will find that we have the strength to face these troubled times. It comes not only from being in tune, but from manifesting that attunement by learning to live more by the power within than by the power without. I remember seeing pictures of um, some of the old American Indians and contrasting their faces with the faces of people today who think of themselves as powerful because they've got cars and they can fly anywhere they want to and so on. But what a difference in the man. Such strength in their faces. And you look around you in the faces in the cities today, you don't see strength. In fact, I remember one monk in India talking after having been on a lecture tour of America. And this was during the hippie era when people were all sort of, everything is beautiful and so on. And... Uh, he was saying, you know what they felt like to me? Like mush. No strength. Because they're getting their strength too much in things. Learn to become centered in yourself. Learn to live from that center. That's why the Danda Swamis in India walk around with this staff to remind them to be centered in the spine, which is symbolized by that staff. Learn to be, always keep your spine straight. Always say yes to life instead of no or maybe or gosh, gee, I hope so. <laughs> yes, you can do it. Yes, you will do it. Yes, this world is a beautiful place if we will just seek in the right way. Seek positive values. Seek positive friends. It's a great mistake to allow negative people into your aura. Look where they're coming from. Don't just hear what they're saying. Look at who they are. Because it's like peeling an onion. As Ramakrishna put it, if you peel an onion, your hands will smell. And so if you're in the presence of people who are negative, if, you're, if you allow yourself to be in the presence of people who are unspiritual or uh, have a hopeless attitude and so on, you'll find in some subtle way that you'll be affected too, unless you're very strong. If you, if you can radiate energy outward, then perhaps you'll be able to change them without being affected. But many people think to do it and don't have the strength to do it. Then they say, well, but I should be able to. Well, but you can't. This law of magneti mag magnetic exchange works both ways. You can attract positive magnetism, but that means you can also be affected by negative magnetism. 
I know that sometimes I've been in the presence of people who were strongly negative, and I would just feel hopeless by the time I'd been with them for five minutes. There's just no way out. Oh, <laughs> and then I'd just throw it out of my mind, and I'd suddenly see, well, of course there's a way out. But you talk to some people, if there's a pr problem that you're facing, they'll, they'll present it to you in such a way that you might as well just throw in the towel. In fact, I remember with our, our uh, CPU, our, uh, some of our members started an um, electronics business, um, computer business. And they weren't running it very well, and I was always sort of uneasy about it, but they kept saying, oh, it's all bright, and they were trying to do positive thinking, but you've got to have some substance behind your positive thoughts. You can't just say, oh, I know we'll get to the moon and then wait for a cloud to take you there. <laughs> you have to put out the energy to do it. And so they weren't really putting out positive energy. They were just talking in f sort of cloud-like ways. And I just kept feeling uneasy about it until finally it, 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 I discovered that, in fact, things weren't going well at all. So I called a meeting of them just out of goodwill for them because there was, I wasn't involved in it at all. It wasn't an Ananda business. But I wanted to suggest ways that they could perhaps generate enough positive energy to save the situation. Well, you know, the point of despair and negativity born of that despair had become so strong by that time that they actually resented my making positive suggestions. That's what you'll find also, that people who are in a negative vortex will resent the positive. You therefore can't really change them unless you're very, very strong in your positivity, and the chances are they'll persecute you if you try. The best thing is don't get involved. Be with positive people. Master used to say that environment is stronger than willpower. The company you keep determines what your own quality of spiritual power will be. Mix with spiritual people if you want to be spiritual. Mix with artists if you want to be an artist. It's that magnetic exchange, far more than the information you get, that will determine what you really accomplish. Again, another technique, and I'll finish with this, to protect yourself against negativity when you have to be involved in it, concentrate on the heart, the heart chakra behind the physical heart. Harmonize the vibrations there, and then actively, positively, send out harmonious vibrations in all directions from the heart chakra. You'll find that if you have to go into negative environments um, or living in a negative world like this where there's so much cause for despair and uh, just feeling pulled down by it, if you will just constantly radiate outward this, this light, that nothing will be able to touch you. Another way that Yogananda put it was, if you are in Om, nothing negative will be able to touch you. If you think of Om, concentrating on Om at the point between the eyebrows, for example, better still if you can hear Om or see the light and just live in that thought of light. And that's your answer to the world and its problems, too. You can't really solve it by reading the newspaper and knowing all the terrible things that are happening over there in Lebanon or Arabia or wherever else. But live in the light. You don't need to know all about the shadows in order to understand the light. Live in the light and you will find that whatever good can be accomplished through you will be accomplished in an optimum way through that means. Share that light with others, live in the thought of Om, live in the thought of God, and then radiate it actively outward. Just don't keep it all to yourself. Radiate that light outward. Share, be a channel for it, and you will be able to do far more than you even can dream of because the influence isn't something you can see outward. It's not something you can make a graph of or add up and create statistics about. And yet, it will change. It will change your life. It will change the lives of others. It will have an effect upon many, many more people than you can dream of. Have that faith. It's a truth that I'm talking about. It's a truth not created or discovered by me. It's one of the truths that the masters have handed down for the through the ages. Live by it and prove it to yourself. You'll know it so. Okay, thank you all. <laughs>